little time ago. Uh, one of the uh, session leaders in this workshop. I was going to give a good introduction to myself so you know what I'm about. Um, I'm probably a postdoc at Durham. I've done most of my research career working on strong gravitational lensing, using lensing to understand the matter, using lensing to understand black holes, uh, various other galaxies and nature and structure. Uh, and the other thing I spend a lot of time doing is working with medical researchers on cancer research, developing basically sharing our statistical techniques and methods with like cosmology and trying to branch them out into medicine. But kind of also going the other way and finding the techniques that we use in biotech and apply it to our field. And you're going to hopefully see that come through in this talk with the sessions as we go through this. So a lot of the, especially the later sessions, what the methods you're going to see are actually kind of things that we've taken from biotech and introduced into cosmology. Uh, the other person leading these sessions is Richard Hayes, who's sat here. So Richard's a software engineer who's been working with myself at Durham for a very long time now, I think probably four or five years. Um, when you go through the sessions, if you think that the software is good, if you think that the API is clear, if like, you write the type of code and it does what it should, Hopefully that's what happens, then you should thank Rich for that because it's not something that I could have ever done with my training in astronomy, writing Fortran code for the PhD student. Made the job of life in a few years ago. So, the goal of this uh, lecture will basically be really to give a high level overview of all the things we're going to cover in the session. But obviously, you don't want to go into too much detail because that's the purpose of the sessions, but kind of give you an end to end overlook. So, you've got a feel for, you know, when you're doing session one, you've got a feel for why we're doing things this way and where we're going later on, as well as sort of a high level understanding of, you know, where this is all going. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll get going. If you've got any questions, I don't think this is going to come in at like the full 90 minute slot, so feel free to stop me at any time, ask clarifications, um, and yeah, let's go. So, uh, as an overview, although this is the observational data set, my goal here is to really give you the tools to analyze the observational data sets that are relevant for your specific science case. So, we will do one sort of real world example. Here. My field of research got strong gravitational lensing, but a lot of the lectures we're going to go through are going to kind of be as data set agnostic as possible so that you can learn the tools that you can apply to your actual field of research. Um, which I think is the best way to do this. So that's what we're going to start with, sort of the most agnostic way. How do I go about fitting a model? Um, and how do I use the sort of probabilistic programming language to do this, which I'll talk about in a second? We'll then go through an, an actual application to the astronomy data, so we're going to be given some Hubble Space Telescope data from strong lens, and we'll learn how we can uh, measure the mass of that lens galaxy uh, and reconstruct the background source galaxy. I'll explain what lensing is in a moment. Uh, and then towards the end, I'm not going to go, this is where we get technical, these kind of session three, four, five, but I'll start to sort of give a hint of where this is going in the context of big data. So instead of analyzing one lens galaxy, you how do we analyze 10,000 lens galaxies instead of analyzing one spectra of cluster of your research? How do I do spectral analysis to the whole SDSS database? Okay, so yeah, we're going to go over the model fitting. Um, yeah, so I've got some pictures here of the types of things you hopefully think about when you think about the idea of fitting a model to data. So uh, astronomers don't do this so much, but in a lot of scientific fields, this world really would just be kind of various or linear regression or fitting a line to data. Um, there's a whole unit. Massive field of statistical literature about how do you do this, how do you this on data sets, how do you extract information in this way. And in astronomy, we tend to deal with things that are more at um, the bottom here. So, if you're familiar with Barbara Chain Monte Carlo analysis, MCMC, walking around the Frank space to infer sort of models that best fit the data. Uh, we'll cover a bit of that in these lectures. And then I've also got Bayes' theorem. The main thing I'm going to say about the way I've approached these lectures is what you're going to be learning is Bayesian inference. The tools you're going to be using are Bayesian in inference, but I have intentionally avoided doing this in a way that relies on formal equations and like mathematical understanding. So the idea is you go through these sessions, you'll get the principles of how these things work, but you may want to, you know, in your own time, fill in these sort of more formal um, mathematical understanding of how this actually ties together um, formally a Bayesian sense. And I'll quickly add that the session leader of Marika may fill in some of these gaps um, sort of alongside mine. So mine's kind of a high level, how do you know the model fitting, and hopefully some of the details will be filled in uh, elsewhere in this course. Yeah, so I want to give, this is basically, this is the starting point for how we're going to do model fitting. So I said that I wanted to kind of make it the most agnostic, you know, data agnostic, research agnostic, simple example that anyone can kind of use and get the core principles and then be able to apply them to their problem. So the first session is basically going to get us to do the following bit. So suppose I've got an instrument, and this instrument measures a 1D signal, but it's 9D, which is shown here. 
And in this example, we're going to suppose that we know that this underlying signal is a Gaussian. Obviously, it could be something else, and we'll show some examples in the session where it becomes more complex. But for now, we're just going to assume it's a 1D Gaussian. And the question we're going to ask is basically, OK, if I've got this data set, if I've measured this, if I've observed this, how do I determine what the original Gaussian was? What is the original, you know, what is the center of that Gaussian? You can probably see it's around the field density. What is the width of that Gaussian? It's probably our maximum or equivalent to a sigma. So the first session is really going to be about to writing the Python code of modeling tools to take, in this case, this data set, but really, you know, the point that you can apply this to any data set and infer the premise of a model to give it some data. So there's a very high level overview of how algorithmically this works. Uh, the process is basically as follows. You, first you pick a model, so my model here is going to be a 1D Gaussian, and I've chosen to parameterize it, you can parameterize it in different ways, in this case it has three parameters, a center, a normal elevation, which controls how high it is, and a sigma value, which controls how wide it is. And we've got to basically figure out what value of center matches the data, what value of normalization matches the data, what, value, what combination of these three parameters matches the data. And so the sort of approach you can imagine is you might randomly draw a set of parameters, numpy dot rand, and you get these numbers, 60, 20, 50, you know, just pop them out of the head. And the key point is we know the equation of Gaussian, I'll show that in Python code in a moment. So given these parameters, we can create a 1D Gaussian. That's a very simple thing to do. We'll see the Python code in the session. Uh, so yeah, so from these numbers, I can create a model Gaussian, which is red for Great. Um, and all we then want to do is we compose the model, we define the model, we use that model as a set of parameters to sort of draw a realization of the data. Hopefully this is stuff into our Bayesian, so some of you are familiar with this stuff. We then fit our model Gaussian to the data, shown here, there's nothing on the data, this is a bad fit. And we quantify how good the fit is via some goodness of fit statistics. Some of you may have heard of a chi-squared. Um, for this, I've chosen to use the law of likelihood that the two are pretty much interchangeable. Uh, these are the residuals, so the data minus the model clearly this particular example of the Gaussian was a bad fit. Uh, but the point is, in model fitting, you basically repeat this process thousands of times, potentially tens of thousands of times, using something called a nonlinear search, which will be introduced in the session. Um, this, this approach has you know, this strategy. It guessed, if, 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 if a previous guess gave a good fit, it guesses things closer to that. And by repeating this process thousands of times, you will hopefully eventually land on a solution, a set of Gaussian parameters that match the data, and indeed that landed here on something that we reached the data. So the first session is really providing you all the tools to go through this, but obviously there's a lot of steps that are kind of missed out here. And the key point being, again, that although this is a 1D signal with noise in it, by the end of the session you should have a clear idea how you could remove this data, put in the data that's relevant to whatever science you do, whatever astronomy you do, and begin you know, doing some toy model fits for a problem that's actually relevant to you. Okay, so one could go about doing that by writing all the Python code yourself from scratch. Um, it's not actually that hard, it'll probably take a couple of days, maybe a week, depending on how proficient you are on Python. Um, but this is kind of a it's a waste of time, it's wasted effort. This is a task that people have, you know, people have done many, many, for many, many decades, and will do for many decades to come. So there's a lot of infrastructure now in the open source software world. The base tries to facilitate this, streamline this, you do take care of all of the legwork for you. And so this is kind of in this realm of what's called formalistic programming. These are basically open source packages that provide a framework that makes it easy for you to specify a probabilistic model by specifying the Gaussian that I just showed and perform the inference side from the fitting procedure I just showed you. There are absolutely tons of these PPLs now. It's quite daunting when you Google this and start going through you know, the vast library of these. There's things like IMC Stand that are kind of, you would read them and I think astronomers kind of understand what's going on. But with the world of like machine learning, there's a lot of things that I, I you read them. They're quite challenging to see how they fit in with sort of the research we did. So these are things like TensorFlow, if you're not doing deep learning machine learning, they're quite complicated. Uh, or they, they're quite hard to see how they fit into astronomy. Uh, so my main take home point is these lectures are going to use a PPL myself and Rich developed, because it's all I know how to use. Uh, and it's, you know, I think it's got a good API, it's got a good interface for astronomers. I think it's sort of, you know, like, I think it read this, it gives, you know, we are astronomers, so it's quite closely paired the interface with the sort of problems you'll do. But the first thing I'll say is, you know, once you're done with these lectures, if you think this, these are the tools you need, if you think that this is sort of relevant to a research problem, 
stop googling comments and program managers, stop reading about client TV and uh, stop reading about test clips. Make sure that you choose the right one. Auto fit is great for the lectures, but it might not be appropriate for what you're actually going to do in the long term. So, uh, yeah. Check out the landscape of things if you think that these problems are if, if the things you're using in these sessions seem relevant, start reading around sort of the promise of programming open source ecosystem to figure out what is most appropriate for you. Um, but to kind of give you a sense of why I think Autofit uh, is sort of useful for astronomers, just so you've got a feel for that, for sort of why we're using it for these, the main thing, the main things that differentiate it from the main reason we developed our own and didn't use what was already existing in the literature, the reason we felt that we had to do this, was that existing PBOs don't, they don't really give you a sense of like what the results, they don't give clear outputs on the results, they don't give clear visualization, they try to kind of streamline things at a much higher level than I think we as astronomers typically expect. We like to have a data set, we like to fit it with a model, we like to gain a lot of interest and understanding for why the model fits the data in that way and what we're learning. And we kind of really incrementally work there in order to do science. And it sounds perverse, but most PPLs kind of work the opposite. They're kind of like, I'm going to get as much data as possible, put it in this box, and bam, results come out. Uh, so it's really sort of really, yeah, it's, I don't think you'll see this as you go through the sessions, but it's designed to really allow you to inspect the results, understand the results, and kind of ask probing questions as you go. Uh, the other relevant things are there's a lot of sort of tools for scaling up the big data. These are what we're going to cover in the later sessions. A lot of particular emphasis on making things sort of interface very nicely with doing large scale analysis on supercomputers, um, which again is the kind of use case that we as astronomers think of normal, but it's actually quite niche and less common in those sort of broader sort of different rooms. Um, data science world. Um, so, yeah. What I'm trying to say here is I think it's, you know, it's a good tool for us to learn this. I think it's good for us to learn about astronomers, but again, check out all of everything else in this sort of um, direction in the way. Okay, so now we're going to give a quick overview of the interface of the software. So as you go through session one, you've got like kind of an understanding of how we approach things. And um, obviously all of this will be reinforced and built upon in the session. Um, so the question is again, how do we how do we go about using Autofit to do the thing I said, fit a Gaussian to this noisy 1D data. So what are the tools? How do we do what are the tools? What is the interface? What is the API? Uh, and there's basically three steps that are required in order to compose a model and fit it to data in this way. The first is we need to define our model. So in this case, this was the Gaussian um, that we used to fit to this data. And so as I said, different libraries, different populist programs just go about this in different ways. This is the interface we're going to use for AutoFit, where we really have sort of, it's really tied to um, Python classes and sort of the basic building blocks, the building blocks of how you would write code in Python. So what you would do if you were defining this Gaussian is you would write a class. I'll just add, if you're not too proficient in classes in Gaussian, and this is sort of if you tend to stay on the more procedural functional, functional, functional side, it shouldn't matter. We use classes a bit. It should be obvious. Where you know, we don't use classes in any technical way, you should be able to see in the session. If you've got questions about classes, you can ask us. So, although uh, uh, some people, when they see a class, they get scared of it, it's horror. It should be really straightforward, like we're, we're reusing it in the most basic simple way. But yeah, you'd write a class like this. So, the key point being that the interface hopefully is clear. You name the class, what the model component is a Gaussian. You have input parameters, the center, the normalization of the sigma, and some magical pattern in a moment where these input parameters, it's going to recognize as kind of the three parameters of the model that we're going to fit for, that we're going to iterate over lots and lots of times when we fit the data. So there's going to be some magic going on with these input parameters here. And then the other thing one would typically do, although this is not absolutely necessary, is you might attach methods to your class that are the methods you use to generate the model data. I showed the red curve that was the model Gaussian. Well, that's what this function does. It uses the equation of a Gaussian given um, where the Gaussian is being evaluated, so the x-axis, in order to create the model Gaussian that we would then ultimately go on to fit to the data that we like to fit. Um, so sort of look out for that. So the first thing we've done is we've proposed, you know, we defined what our model is going to be in a Python class. This is the first step of any sort of model fitting exercise. You need to define the model. Um, the next integral ingredient that you know if comes before you look at one of these is writing a likelihood function. We call it, we go for the term log likelihood function, 
because if you've written a lightning function, you'll probably return the log. And a lot of people get confused with this. We use a lot of lightning functions because it's more explicit. I found that people who are new to this, they find it confusing. Why is this one? So a lightning function and a log lightning function are the same thing. We've chosen to go with a log lightning function because I, I think it's, it, it seems to make more sense to people who are beginners who are that this is the you know, tool with the match fix. Um, yeah, so you're going to now basically write a log lightning function. In the world of autofit, this means that you can paste in what's called an analysis part. Um, Again, just a class where you can plop stuff in. Uh, the key point is there's sort of two components to the analysis class. All of the things you're going to fit in your likelihood function, so the data, and also the noise, this um, go in the init constructor. This could be uh, extended with lots of things that are relevant to your model fitting problem. So in the example I'm going to go for a moment for lending, this init constructor is also going to have a point square function, which is going to describe the blur and the optics of the Hubble Space Telescope. If you've got extra things that kind of need to be folded through your model fitting procedure, you just whack them all in there. And then that means you can then use them in your log likelihood function when you're actually going to fit them all to the data. Uh, and so this log likelihood function, the main thing it does is, how I said, using the method I just described, it creates a model version of the Gaussian in the red curve, and it goes through the steps I just showed. It subtracts the data from the model, getting the residuals, it quantifies this using a chi squared and the likelihood that it returns this. So this is the function that the fitting algorithm going to call thousands of times over and over with different model um, parameters coming in. And so that notion of different model parameters comes in with this instance thing. Uh, this is where it will make more sense in the sessions. This is kind of getting a little bit too technical for a lecture. But the point is, every time an instance comes in, it corresponds to a Gaussian with a sensor with an intensity and a sigma, where the values of these have been set and chosen by your model fitting algorithm. So they, as, the, as, as this gets called over and over, they should get closer to you. Every time it comes in, they should get a little bit closer to models that fit the data better than we did to be. And so again, there's a bit of magic going on where the, the values coming in are kind of being automatically updated in the background. Um, but it was, yeah, I say, in the session, I think, to make sure it's not the best mixture of all. And then the third step is you've got a model, your Gaussian, you've defined it as a model with three parameters. So First line is doing, so this first line is where that magic happens where it converts the center, the normalization, and the sigma to the three parameters. Uh, priors are also, if you're familiar with priors, also kind of come in here, you'll see in the session. Uh, you find that, you've defined your analysis class, so you just put the data in one of these, you've done what the log in function. The last thing you need to do is choose the algorithm you're going to use that's going to do this process of fitting the model to the data thousands of times and trying to find the combination of parameters that fit the data. Throughout these sessions, uh, in the first session, we're going to use EMC, which is a Markov chain Monte Carlo tool that many astronomers are familiar with. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Um, in the later sessions, we're going to use a nested sampling algorithm called Dynasty. As I said, in the, the, the aim of these workshops, we're going to treat the nonlinear search, we're going to treat these big algorithms as black boxes. I will, in the first session, give a, a sort of pseudoscience interpretation for how they work, but we're going to avoid all the technical details because you know. Everything that goes on inside here is probably a five session lecture in and of itself. And I think I do that say, I believe that the reading stuff will cover a bit of this, but we're basically going to treat this as a black box. We have a thing that fits a model to the data and it gives us the answer. And that's, that's, that's sort of the approach we're going to take with these lectures. Again, but obviously you should uh, dig deeper if you start to uh, use this for real in, your, uh, in the actual research and science you do. Yeah, so you, you do this and then you get a result. So EMC does this black box magic. Black box magic, it will find the Gaussian in the really good fit that I showed. We would recover this red curve, and the session will plot the data, and we'll be like, yay, we've got a Gaussian that looks like our data will pat ourselves on the back and be happy. And then we start to produce, um, there's lots of tools to kind of analyze the results. We'll give a bit of an overview of those, but they're not too important. But the sort of things you can do, if you've seen these kind of plots in papers, um, is produce these corner plots where you get like these probability distributions of the parameters and the function of the number. So we can see here. X is the center, we've got a probabilistic distribution peaking around 50, which by I we knew was the correct solution. And with the probabilistic distribution, we can say things like there's a 95% probability, I have 95% confidence intervals, that the value of X is within this particular range. So if you've seen these types of plots in papers, they crop up a lot now, at least in my research field. And never been 100% sure what they mean, how to interpret them. Hopefully by the end of session one, you'll have a, a clearer idea of sort of what's going on with these. 
Okay, so I'm about to shift gear and go on to sort of the overview of session two, which is on the lending. I'll pause for if there's any questions on kind of that. That's what I was kind of there as kind of session one, getting us up and running with getting our multi page. Are there any questions before I keep going? Fine, if not. Great. Um, yeah, so in session two, we're, we're, we're not really going to, we're basically going to take the tools we've learned in session one. And instead of fitting a weird agnostic arbitrary Bondi Gaussian into the noisy Bondi data set, we're going to apply to a real astronomy scientific use case, which in this case is my theory of research, strong gravitational lensing. Uh, so, in case people um, aren't you know, too in the know of what the strong gravitational lens is, in most galaxy formation and evolution, we look at galaxies, which is a normal galaxy, and the galaxies that we, we observe, that light comes into our telescope. And we try to do things like we say, well, this is the bulge and this is the disk, or, and this is the bulge disk ratio. We just learn things about the galaxy by studying that light. Um, strong gravitational lenses are basically very rare systems in the universe. We have two galaxies perfectly aligned down the line of sight. I'm going to show a schematic of that in a moment. And the mass, the gravitational field of the foreground galaxy, basically curves space time. This means that the light rays from the background galaxy can multiple paths around the lens meaning we actually observe the background source multiple times, typically four times, before it varies. So this red thing in the center is a galaxy that comes closer to us, and behind it is a blue star forming galaxy whose light is being multiplied, stretched and sheared into this giant ring of light with all these different light rays are coming around. And so what we're going to do in session two is we're going to take a uh, Hubble nature of a strong gravitational momentum like this, not, not this one because it's too hard to analyze, <laughs> And we're going to infer the mass of the foreground lens, and we're going to try to infer the original light distribution of the background source. So we're going to build all the tools necessary to do that. Uh, this is just sort of a 2D schematic in case, you know, the, what I just described the bottom of the sense. So, yeah, there's a galaxy in the middle, typically a big, massive elliptical galaxy. You need a lot of mass to observe these lenses. It's lending some sort of redshift one to distant galaxy. In this case, background source is a lot more boring, it's just two red bulbs of light, but you can see there's two clear distinct forms of images. So this is the sort of scientific use case we're going to use to build on everything we learned in session one. Okay, so other than just you know, other than just doing an analysis on real data and sort of applying it to a real science use case, there are a few uh, lessons, um, concepts that I want, I'm hoping you'll take from session two. And the main one relates to getting think about thinking about how composing models, building models that are scalable, the word I'm going to emphasize a lot here is extensible. Building models that can kind of you can keep adding complexity, you can keep making more complex, you can keep asking more specific, detailed, difficult science questions is a bit of an art form. People often sort of race to fitting a model. But then the tools they've built, the type of code they've got, doesn't allow them to start asking more detailed questions. So it's really important that the way you think about model composition, the way you break down your models as you define them, is done so in this kind of extensible way. So it's kind of basically trying to abstract uh, the, model, the model composition in a way that you know, this is clear to So what, this is quite hard for lecture, but the reason I want to do this now is because when you do session two, you kind of start to, start to click what I'm on about and you have a bit more things. So although this is a little bit weird, I think it helps when you get to this. But the way, that, so with a strong lens, the way that we're going to try and get you to think in session two is, okay, I've got this strong gravitational lens picture at the top here, and I want to learn about it. I want to fit a model to it. How should I define a model? How should I compose a model? How should I break this strong gravitational lens down in a way that really boils it down to its individual constituent components when I do the model thing? So when I was learning how to do all this gravitational lens stuff, PhD student five, ten years ago. Um, this was the process I went through, and I was like, okay, well, the first thing I learned is a, a strong gravitational lens. As I described, it's composed of two things. There's like a foreground galaxy that I want to learn things about, maybe I want to understand its mass. And there's like a background galaxy, a lens source galaxy, maybe you know, I want to learn about it, I want to, do, I want to learn how bright it is, I want to learn about its light distribution. So I was like, my model, I need to kind of break that down into two separate model components. There's the lens. And the source. So I sort of started to abstract the problem, I started to break down the model in this way. And then I went through the same process again. I was like, well, the foreground galaxy, there's actually two things I want to learn about here. 
uh, with the light distribution of the lens galaxy, but I also want to know about the mass distribution. So then my model would kind of be then broken down again into two separate constituent parts. I uh, separately I'll like the source, there's only one thing I want to learn about the light. Um, the way the thing I say to people that often helps me at this point is uh, try to think about modeling, try to think about model composition like Lego. If you can make your model like Lego, then you're gonna have a really extensible, powerful way to start getting more complex models, start scaling yourself in different, unique ways um, that you know, allow you to do more detailed, more difficult, more pressing science questions. So yeah, try and figure out what the Lego, the building blocks of Lego are for your particular science problem. Um, so the sort of thing we'll see in session two that's kind of trying to illustrate this is we'll start to write light profiles that are going to describe the light of galaxies. Uh, so you may have heard of the Democulus profile, that people typically get to massive ellipticals, it's a very cursive profile, if you've seen that in the literature, it doesn't matter if you haven't. Uh, so we're going to write a type of class that is a light profile model. This is the equivalent of the galaxy I showed you previously, but now it's got, now it's just representing the light of galaxies, these are all the three parameters. So again, it's a ball of light at the center, it's got ellipticity, most galaxies are elliptical, uh, it's got brightness, it's got a radius. So we're going to start just basically building a model that instead of it being a galaxy, we're going to start putting these components in the represent things of the galaxy. So yeah, we'll define a light protocol. This is going to be um, the light of our lens galaxy. We've got one of our Lego blocks. Uh, we're going to do the same for the mass profile. So the lens galaxy mass is going to be a massive thermal mass distribution. You may have heard of that. Again, it doesn't matter if you're not familiar with the, the specifics. It, they're not particularly the important. This is like another Lego block. That we're going to start using to build the model in the way I just described. And we're also going to use an exponential light profile for the source, because this is more appropriate for distant galaxies. Um, but we, we could have used for the bottom of this if it really were worse fit. Just to add, we'll sort of see that in the way I showed before, there are going to be methods that are what we're going to use to generate the model later if we fit to the, uh, the strong lens. So, in the way that we generate 1D Gaussians and fit of it to this data, we're going to see that there's going to be these functions that allow us to generate images of a Democulus profile, i.e. what the Democulus looks like if we observe it. Images of the source, and we're also going to include all the lensing stuff in here if we need to make the art. So we'll see how we do. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's what this is going to do. Um, one thing, one more thing I'll add. And I'll add that we'll also see how when we create these images, the point spread function I mentioned earlier, the blur images, the optics, is also factored into the model, so you'll also get a sense of how sort of steps in the data processing and acquisition start to fold into your idea function. But this is great, so, but the, in terms of the Lego, in terms of trying to think about model composition in this way, we just wrote, I've shown you the Python code which gives us this thing, the light lens, this thing, the massive lens, and this thing, the light of the source. But we still don't have the tools necessary to start to put this together as a galaxy. We want to kind of pair these two things together in order to build this thing. We want to kind of put this thing in something that is a, is a, is a, is a background source galaxy. And so this is where we're going to briefly introduce the kind of advanced model composition API in order to illustrate this. Um, we'll introduce it quickly to in session two and then we use it again because it's quite technical. I think it's worth it. I want to get the concepts across, but it's sort of I didn't want to sort of have over all the sessions because it's be quite technical. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing to introduce. I want to uh, introduce it to get this concept across, but then we'll move on back to simple things in session three. Uh, but in terms of how this looks, basically what we need to do is we need to propose what's called a multi level model. We need a model that has an inner level, a level above it, and then a level above that, which is the strong lens itself. And so we need to, we need to propose a multi level model. Um, in order to do this via the autofit AGI, we basically use hierarchies of Python classes. So what we start to do is we take the Python classes I showed earlier, light profiles, the mass profiles, and we start to encase them in other Python classes that contain those Python classes. So if you're not familiar with object-oriented programming, it's probably all sounding a bit of a nightmare right now. But the point is, this is the correct way to kind of design a model that is extensible and scalable. Um, so if you do stop doing, using, doing this stuff in the long term, it's sort of in scale. Um, the problem is you can't even conceive of yet. So what's going to happen, I mean, this is really for session two, just to really to give you a sense of why we're doing this in session two when we get there, is we're then going to define the kind of galaxy class, which is the two Lego components I showed above, the Lego source, and the key point is its input parameters are not just 
numbers. They're not just a center or an effective radius, but it now includes lists of light and mass profiles. So we can make a lens galaxy using this that has light profile values at the bottom, that has mass profile values as a thermal, and all of the things we need to do the lens calculations is sort of put in one single thing. So this is where I said, I think when you do such a tool, it's hopefully they don't want sense. But I want to get across another actually because I think it's good to kind of, again, know where we're going with this as you're doing the session. Uh, but yeah, basically the point is, yeah, you're creating sort of higher level model components, these multi-level model components, that allow you to start building a model up um, like that. So I get that this is a bit kind of the point, it's meant to be, and then if we, of course, come to session two, um, so yeah, these are basically giving you the tools to compose a model in this way, and you have inner components, a level above that, you have upper components like galaxies, and then a level above that, those galaxies come together to form a strong lens. And the really important thing about this, the reason we do this, um, I'm going to skip over this, just the API stuff, um, uh, and this is just the idea we don't need. The reason we do this is if you use these tools in the right way, you can compose a multi-level model in this extensible way, uh, you design everything in a way that it's easy to bolt on additional Lego blocks, it's easy to kind of add another galaxy in here, it's easy to put more light code blocks in the galaxy. What one of those finds, uh, which is what we found with Volta Lens, kind of, uh, we've already found the software I developed kind of unintentionally, is you suddenly have the tools to do an analysis you could have never otherwise conceived of. So by, by following these principles, we suddenly have the tools to not just analyze these single galaxy scale strong lenses, or a single galaxy lens is a single galaxy, but we could actually apply them to the sort of these galaxy clusters where hundreds of galaxies are lending hundreds of background galaxies. We didn't design the software to do this, it wasn't like an intentional thing, but because we compose models as these really simple basic Lego blocks, we could start to just throw in loads of galaxies, loads of macro profiles, loads of light profiles, in order to analyze things that were on a larger scale than we ever conceived of in this case galaxy clusters. So the key word here, the thing I'm really trying to emphasize in session two, is I want you to be thinking about extensibility. Not just how do I write a model that's going to fit my data set and allow me to do science, but how do I break that model down? How do I abstract that model into these core components, into these basic Lego blocks, that will then allow me to fit even more complex models to you, even more bigger or complex data sets than I could have ever previously conceived. If you can get those concepts across, you'll be sort of writing software Write a Python code for your modeling problem that in a year's time will be allowing you to do things that you never thought you would do, but now you can, it doesn't require any effort. So the key word for session two, other than the actual application to uh, lensing, is extensibility. We want to design models in this extensible, expandable, um, Lego y way. Okay, so I'll get into some questions. I can keep going if not. Just out of curiosity, can we? Yeah, so strong gravitational lensing is widely regarded that the best estimates of a galaxy's mass we have in normal astronomy, like the most accurate and the most precise, are inferred as the mass you estimate from the strong lens. So the quantity called the Einstein mass is basically the mass within a cylinder traced out by the source galaxy. And this gives you the mass of the galaxy to about a 5% precision, which is, you know, much, much, much more precise than like sort of things you get from stellar population synthesis. Dynamics are good, but dynamics have the, so yeah, like, um, you, yeah, you, so you, it's, a, it's a very powerful way to measure massive galaxies. You obviously don't get any information on the mass of the background source because it's only being lensed, because it's not, you have to be lensed by something in order to learn about mass. Okay, cool. Um, so that's pretty, uh, I'm going to show a few brief slides, some of you have really interesting uh, data. So it's actually probably relating to two things, and sort of things you've probably read in papers, just fill in some holes about what this, when you pick up this table, what it means. We're first going to do a quick example of Bayesian model comparison. Again, we're not going to focus on the formal Bayesian side of this. I would encourage you to you know, put that up in your own time, and I think it may come up in some of the other sessions. We're just going to run through how you would do Bayesian model comparison. What, it is, what does it mean when a paper says we perform Bayesian model and so the, it basically amounts to you've got some data, um, 
is trying to figure out what model best represents that data. What model is the most, in, 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 in the best sense that you can confirm is the sort of most likely to be the true representation of the data. So the sort of question you might ask is if I've got a Hubble Space Telescope imaging of a galaxy, what is the correct model for me to fit this with? Is it a single Devolcumus profile and therefore this galaxy is just the bulge? Is it a Devolcumus profile that represents the bulge, but also an exponential profile that represents like a disk component where all the stars form? So then you have sort of two components of bulge and this. Is it something else? Maybe we need to put a bar in there. Maybe you know, it's the tools you need to kind of take a data set and sort of probably in, in the correct way infer what the most likely sort of original structure in that data set is. For the galaxy formation, it's this kind of structural decomposition. But again, in all, in all of the research fields you work in, all of the different fields, you'll be asking very different questions. But the key point again is it's the tools that allow you to do this. It's like how do you how do you fit models to data and make this decision, which we're going to try and show you uh, in the beginning of session three. Uh, and then the other sort of problem we're going to face uh, in session three is what do I do if I have multiple observations of the same galaxy, the same signal, the same data set? Um, how do I you know, fit a model to this data? What's the correct way to do this now by so many more data? So just the problem we've had in the talk up to now. So lensing is quite a good example, this is a really rubbish simulated lens, but the sort of things happen are we might have a red wave like image where we can pretty much only see the lens galaxy. The source is kind of there, you can't really see anything different. We might have a blue wavelength image where the lens becomes a lot faker and the source becomes bright. Show here, so the lens is kind of faker blob now. Uh, yeah, and if we're going to basically ask this to be faced with these sort of problems like what is the correct way to fit a model? What do I do to my model in order to fit multiple data sets in this way? Um, and the sort of, there's two steps to this. The first is what do I do to my likelihood function? So how do I kind of, in the, in the context of getting a likelihood of goodness of fit, in fact, holding that will prove, how is that extended to fitting all the data sets? But the deeper question is, how should I update the model to reflect this? Do I, you know, does my model need to change all of the properties of the galaxy as a function of wavelength? Or does my model need to only have a few parameters? We'll try and get you thinking about sort of the, the questions and the way, the, you know, the questions you have to ask in order to do this. Um, yeah, that's basically all session three. Like session three, we really need to be building on. There are two things we want to learn in session three. Okay, and then session four and five where things actually get exciting um, because we're going to try and basically Think about in this world of big data, in this era of big data, in this era of giant galaxy catalogs, how do we use the sheer size and magnitude of these data sets to extract even more information um, than we ever did before? There's, what tools allow us to do this? What approaches, what way do we need to think in order to do this? And so I'm going to try and sort of give the, get the idea across in this final part of the talk, because this is a really, this, this took me a long time to learn. And get my head around. So if, we, if I can plant the seeds in your brains now, that when you do it in session four and five, you kind of got the basis to go on, I think it will get you a lot quicker. Uh, yeah. So I think I suspect every single one of us, irrespective of what our field of science, uh, astronomy research is, um, feels like there's a lot of data. Um, well, there's about to be a lot of data. You just launched two days ago. Uh, so for me, you just about to give me a lot of data. Uh, yeah. So in strong lensing, my research field, you know, for 50 years. This has been our premier sample of lenses. There's been hundreds of papers written on these things. I've spent nearly a decade just analyzing these 50 objects in excruciating detail over and over and over again. Uh, when, we, when you can start taking data, within the first week, it's going to have found this many strong lenses. So my research field has had, you know, that handful of things for 50 years is about to just about to change, about to be revolutionized. We're going to have 100,000 of these things by the end of the And I'm sure this story of there suddenly being loads of data and suddenly being way more objects than you could ever conceive of previously resonates with a lot of you in whatever research field you do. And so this is sort of the question is like, well, this requires us to completely change the ways we approach our statistical analysis, our model picking, um, because there's a lot more, there's information within the sample at this scale that can be extracted. And that's what this sort of session four and five is going to try and um, have an understanding about how that information can be extracted. Because it's really quite about, I mean, to be able to 
it took a long time to get it done. So the basis with which we're going to do this in session four and five is going to use what's called a graphical model. Um, so a graphical model, this is an example of how one might compose or you know, design a graphical model for one of the um, So the point now is, imagine we've got hundreds of data sets, hundreds of lenses. The change in thinking you get when you enter this big red data regime typically is, in a lot of cases, you now no longer care about the individual results of an individual data set of an individual so in the previous session, we were trying to measure the mass of the foreground lens. When you've got this many lenses, the point is I don't care what the mass of this lens is. I don't care what the mass of this lens is. The thing I'm trying to learn about are the global properties of the lens galaxies as a sample. I care about what the distribution of the masses are of all galaxies in the universe. So I don't really care if this thing has a big mass or small mass. I don't care about any of the galaxies. I care about the sample as a whole. So it's really trying to shift your thinking and using new statistics Tools, instead of making inferences about individual data sets, you do inferences on the data set as a whole. And when you apply this to cosmology, a second thing happens, because in cosmology, which is the thing at the top, typically in cosmology, you do care about one thing, which is the cosmological parameters. And so your inferences on this, this is all going to make sense when I go through the session in a moment, but the point is, you're, you're really, the only thing you want is to estimate the cosmological parameters as precisely and accurately as possible at the top. So anything you can do on your large scale data set that extracts more information or uses that data set in a way to kind of use the large amount of data set to sort of get more information than it otherwise could will improve your performance for So that's what I'm going to try and sort of explain how, how this works. I get it, how this works uh, now in session four and five. I get at the moment the, the, the session five got trying to sort of plant the uh, so, um, yeah. so the idea is using a new branch of statistical methods and techniques that analyze large data sets, i.e. in this case hundreds of strong lenses, in a way that would get a lot more construction, much more precise inference on the cosmological parameters than if you had just analyzed each data set one by one and combined those results on the cosmological parameters by not analyzing them one by one, but by using these kind of graphical modeling tools, you can extract a lot more information and get a much more precise difference. That's what session four and five will show, and I'm going to kind of try and briefly explain how this works in the session to kind of give you that explanation. So, um, in the sessions, we'll go back to this kind of toy model of 1D galaxy impulses. Uh, the reason being that, like, the lensing and stuff, it you know, gets our computation expensive, it takes a long time to run, so I kind of needed to boil it down to something simpler, and also, I think conceptually these are really simple ways to get the core concepts across, I would say they're quite data agnostic. Um, so we're going to go through two examples um, in this lecture, and um, we're going to two examples in this session. Um, that are really going to, as I say, try and emphasize how these graphical modeling stuff. Cool. So the first example is, let's say I've got a set of observations of these 1D Gaussian pulses, they have different sort of noises, they have different uh, appearances. But the thing I know um, going into this, the, you know, the information I'm told as someone who's going to fit a model to these one Gaussian pulses is, you know, Gauss has come down and he's told me that all of these Gaussian pulses have the same center. For whatever reason, that's the property of this data set. And so the goal is to estimate this center. And I'm going to basically show you how one might do this first using the traditional approach, i.e. fitting each pulse one by one by one. And then using this graphical modeling approach. And we're going to see you know, what happens uh, this, when we follow these different approaches and what happens when we try to sort of use this graphical modeling approach that can exploit, I'm claiming can exploit more information from large data sets. Uh, so, in the traditional approach, it's really what we would have done using the tools we learned in session one and two, it's basically what we would have did in session one. Um, we fit each data set, we fit each Gaussian pulse one by one. In each fit, we infer a center at the end, and then we just combine those centers that we've estimated. So if we fit five Gaussians, we have five estimates of the center. We combine those five estimates of the center in some way in order to get our final estimate of what the center of all the Gaussians is. Um, 
In the end session, we're just going to take a very simple weighted average. Which, yeah, the reason. You know, there are more technical uh, advanced methods called common density estimators. We're not. The session will briefly mention those because they're the sort of tools that would be used by a, I think typically a cod, if you read like a CMB paper, like a cosmology paper, they're sort of the techniques that I would say are commonplace. Uh, but we'll keep things simple, uh, just using the weight value. The key point is just for, just for your benefit, everything we show in the session doesn't really matter which one of these we use. Um, and we'll explain when it would matter so you've got that knowledge. But nevertheless, so yeah, we fiddle over the Gaussians, we can combine them into the weight average. And the thing that's important to note here is therefore, we're doing, we have five Gaussians, we're doing five such of bits where each bit has three free parameters the center of the Gaussian, the normalization of the Gaussian, and the center of the Gaussian. And we get these 1B, uh, sorry, these 1B and 2B probability plots for each bit. So these are just showing me that this is, I think I've got four here, they all look roughly the same, all of the centers are around 6 to 50, and the other parameters are kind of moving around because they were about to go. Uh, so yeah, this is sort of how. I think most astronomers would have approached this problem of having many observations of different galaxies, different spectra, or different stars, or whatever. Uh, and if you, when we do this in the session, we, we get Gaussian to the data really well, and we get a really good estimate of the sensor state for our pixel safety with quite high precision. So great. This clearly works. There's nothing wrong with doing it this way. I'm not claiming this is broken in this kind of there's not more information on the video on the table. Uh, so now let's think about how we might approach this, what the differences are if we approach this sort of fitting problem with the graph the model. Um, so in this case, I said there's four data sets. So previously, we would have done four data sets, one by one. Uh, each data set would have three parameters, a total of 12 free parameters, four individual bits. With graphical model, basically what the goal is, is to fit all four data sets simultaneously in a single, grandiose, model fit, just one model, where the key point being that because we're now doing everything um, simultaneously, rather than our model being consisting of four times three independent fits, our model now consists of nine free parameters, so there's one center that's going to be fitted to all four Gaussian data sets at the same time, but the other parameters of the Gaussian, so the single values, uh, the Normalization to all three, they have to be. So I get that this is sounds a hard to imagine, but it's getting the message across. The key point, the key shift in thinking here is instead of, if we have four Gaussians, instead of fitting each one one by one with models that have three parameters, we're going to fit all four simultaneously with a model that is composed in the correct way, with a model where there is only one center that represents all four data sets. The thing we were doing wrong in the traditional fit is we would refit the center over and over and over again when we knew that that wasn't the underlying property of the data that we were trying to extract. We were repeating the center of the free parameter when it wasn't representative of sort of the actual modeling problem that we're trying to understand. Uh, this is like a weird sort of representation of graphical model uh, that comes from other paper that we extract a lot of this stuff from. I put it here just so you're aware that there is like a notation for this stuff, just so you're aware that you know. In the made in inference literature, you know, people, but we're not going to, I'm not expecting you to look at this and know what it means. You, you're, and we're, we're not going to try and portray this type of information to you in the sessions. It's just, I just put it there so you're aware that, you know, there is a notation that if one began to use these practical models that allow one to kind of start representing, um, representing them in concise, uh, in a concise way. Um, and so, if we fit this graphical model, we're now center of a single parameter and kind of it's distributed across all the data sets um, in this way. The first thing that happens is instead of inferring four separate probability distribution plots that I showed earlier, we now get a single probability distribution plot, which where before each one has dimensions of three parameters, so it's sort of three corners. This now, as I said, has nine, where this single column is the single center. Uh, compared to all of the other parameters, i.e. Like the, the individual sigmas and normalizations of the other galaxies. The, for the purpose of this session, the key thing I'm trying to emphasize here is uh, there's a lot of technical detail. Again, instead of having four separate centers that wasn't representative of what we're really trying to understand from the data, there is now just a single center in our model, 
which is the sort of key value of the parameter we're trying to extract. And the graphical model gives an estimate of this, which is shown here. And the main thing we learn is, for this case, the difference in the result is basically negative, negligible. So using this advanced fantasy graphical modeling stuff does not give us any difference in what we learn from the data set in which we fit an 18 to the data set on the one. Which seems like a waste of time, and we probably shouldn't have uh, bothered with all of this nasty Bayesian stuff. But does this happen because we don't have enough data? Like if we have, we have more data, this case would have been better? Or? No, so I'm obviously about to explain okay. what happens. Uh, but in that case, it, the answer is no. If, this, if I had done this with a thousand, if I just if I just kept whacking up the number of data sets, the two would still give basically identical results. Um, so it's it's a it's a different thing that's going on here. Um,
what we're going to do in what we're doing this session. And what we find is that the inferred values of, when we use these traditional approach property centers uh, now start to show some problems. So in this brand, in this particular case that I ran, um, we actually get both of them wrong of one super confidence, they've got quite large offsets, and also measure these errors are relatively large. And so the key point, uh, the sort of the pitfall, the downfall that we're going to argue of this traditional approach is when there's lots and lots of structure in the probability distribution, trying to sort of combine the data sets after the fact via a weighted average or whatever can, can basically go wrong. Um, that's the metric making curve. Uh, whereas, I'm not, I'm not going to just show the graphical model, but the key point is when you fit a graphical model, as I've said before, the center of the first Gaussian and second Gaussian are now just two parameters in the overall model that now contains like I mean, COVID-20 parameters. So we're not kind of having to combine all of these different posteriors after the fact with one another. The combination of all these different posteriors is kind of being fully self-consistently factored through in the model fitting algorithm. The MCMT algorithm or the nested whatever we use is fully solved in and accounting for that when it's computing the probability distributions of the centers of the Gaussians and of course all the parameters. So instead of inferring these kind of nasty general contours, um, and I've got a figure in to illustrate why we, we, we infer these kind of nice clean PDF but I've got a figure to illustrate why we look at the ground. But just to emphasize, we then, what we're going to turn the session, that by taking this approach, we accurately recover the centers and we get smaller errors. So it's kind of basically trying to shift your thinking into like, yeah, analyzing the data in this way, where you know, it challenges you to make the model representative of the whole thing, and this comes with a huge number of computational threats, bottlenecks. But from a statistical sense, it allows you to extract a lot more information, and most importantly, extract that information in a more robust manner. Uh, so there is a question, of course, like these things are super noisy and degenerate, and you're like, well, how did I go from these, which are the individual bits of the two centers, to to something that looks so clean and round like this? These are bits of the yeah, but I mean, it's some of the slight, uh, maybe a little bit of an exaggeration in the way I've written this but the key point is this is a really nice picture that's um, I call it like the sunflower of statistics. Um, what it's basically trying to show is this is like a pictorial representation, representation of the probability distribution that each data set contributes to our model. So one of them might say that the sensors are in this region of the space. One of them might send a sensor in this region of the parameter space. Individually, the data sets are struggling to constrain the sensors and they create these large sort of banana-like expansive contours that are hard to constrain. And you've got to imagine, of course, that in reality this, this is a 2D control representation, but when you're actually in the model fitting, this is like a 6 or 20 or 100 dimensional parameter space. This is, this is going on at a much more complex underlying level. But the point is that Although each individual data set creates these really general, nasty probability controls, they all overlap with one another in different ways. And so they do contain a lot of information about what the centers are. It's just an individual data set by itself can't inform you of that and give you the correct probability distribution. And the key difference is the traditional approach doesn't really have a robust way to kind of combine these and get to this single sense that's shown here. Whereas with the graphical model, that is what that is what the graphical model is extracting. It's robustly kind of what, like solving these different probability distributions in order to figure out that this is the value of the center in this case that best fits the best represents. So that's sort of what the graphical model is trying. That's the that's the key strength or the underlying thing that we're trying to extract in central Um Yeah, I'm gonna add one caveat. Before I do the last part on hierarchical models, because I think it's important. Um, there is like an asterisk or caveat that, I, that is mentioned also in the session, but I want to emphasize here just so people don't go away if you're the wrong idea. Um, the failure of the traditional approach in the example I just showed two Gerstins, where it estimated the wrong centers and was offset, that was because I was using a weighted average, right? Or like a really simple way to combine centers. And this was a really, this, this is a way that the sort of degeneracies that I showed with not 
that was why the estimate was so wrong. If you used the kind of kernel density estimates tools that are commonly applied in things like CMB analysis, so what these would do is they basically make like 2D representations of the probability distributions by fitting two-dimensional functions and then they multiply them together in a very gross, robust way. If you use those kind of tools, I think the expectation is once again, they the, the solution you get should be very close and converge on the solution of the graphical model. So I, I don't want to there are still methods in like, some of the traditional approach of fitting base sets one by one that would in this case converge on the sort of results you would get in a graphical model. Um, so it, I'm not trying to suggest that like, if you read papers that use code that's the estimates of these type of tools. Yeah, I'm not trying to yeah, I think the people should that in very in many cases that is the correct set of tools to use and it can maximally accept the information in your data set. Uh, there's kind of two reasons why you would want to, if you're going to use graphical models, there are kind of two reasons why, where, why you want to use them as opposed to using these. The first is when your models are kind of this simple, where you have like one or two shared parameters and just a couple of tens or twenties of parameters, the kind of the estimate just kind of combine the likelihoods, combine the probability distributions in a way that's robust, but they don't scale to the dimensionality of the problem. So these work when you're multiplying two-dimensional probability distributions together. They might work when you're multiplying three-dimensional probability distributions together, but they, no, I've never seen anyone attempt to apply them to a problem with more dimensions. There's a, there's a brick wall, I mean, I could be wrong, but I've met this kind of brick wall dimensionality where people probably wouldn't trust that these sort of techniques would be applicable. So the first benefit of graphical models is that if you're really going from that model of complex models of many parameters, uh, so you don't have a choice. There's a point where all of the techniques in the different approach just don't scale up. Uh, and the second reason you want to use graphical models, which is the last thing I talk about in this lecture, you get quite sweaty on my slide, is because of hierarchical models. And this is, I think these are the really, really powerful things for working for where, where, where astronomy is going in the network, where some branches of statistical instruments and astronomy are going in the next decade. I think there's going to be some really significant. Uh, just to make sure you want to say where, where am I going with this? Uh, this you know, we just looked over the whole example of one-dimensional galaxy, and this is where the center was this parameter of gold top you were putting on the screen first. Obviously, if you're not following it, the point is the Gaussians are your astronomy data. So for me, the Gaussians are strong gravitational lenses. For you, they might be spectra, they might be images of galaxies, they might be you know, weak lensing sheer catalog. And this Parameters at the top of the time I went the sensors of the Gaussians so that were using these techniques to get much better robust inference on. Obviously, in a real time analysis, might be the cosmological parameters. So, this is the sort of example where you know, this is the sort of the parallels I'm trying to draw between this sort of agnostic 1D, 90 signal fitting. The point is, it should be very take up the 1D Gaussian that's put in your data, and you should very quickly find if you've got something that's reminiscent of the kind of model fitting. That's the problem. We use one of the Gaussians that they're agnostic and they are fast and thin and they're simple, but you should always be thinking if I took out the Gaussians and put in my data of choice, if I took out the, the, the Gaussian model and put in something that represents the micro what would happen? How is it? That, that's the, always should be going in the background, back of your mind and your business interests. Okay, so now let's just finish on hierarchical models, which are a very natural extension of graphical models. Um, and this is where, as I say, this is where the the extraction and the exploitation of information from the large data really comes into its own. I would kind of do the graphical model that I just showed. The argument I was putting forward to use them was really kind of technical and boring. It was basically just like, there's a point where combining lots of fits starts to break down because the dimensionality gets, you know, it gets difficult to multiply lots of probability distributions together. It's a really good reason, but I don't, it doesn't really excite me that much. I don't think it's like really exploiting the information of big data. So this is where hierarchical models come in. Um, what hierarchical models does, uh, if you've seen, there's a really kind of a buzzword going around, at least in the strong ending literature, uh, Bayesian hierarchical analysis, which sounds quite daunting and grandiose. Uh, we're, what I'm going to teach you is Bayesian hierarchical analysis. People, you know, people, if you use this phrase, people will think that you're really good at stats and your paper is really robust. So if 
why you, you, you end up <laughs> going down this route. Um, but yeah, it, I, to me, the like, hierarchical ones, I've never, yeah, hierarchical ones, that, that's what we're going to call this. And um, what they do is they posit that certain parameters across your data set are drawn from some underlying parent distribution. And obviously, I've got an example to reinforce this. This is the thing that really took me a long time to get my head around. So, for example, um, you might posit that a parameter that's shared across all your individual data sets, um, that they are drawn from some sort of parent distribution, that that, and that parent distribution, by, by making that assumption, um, that means that there's kind of more information about your model um, that you can try to utilize in it. Um, so I've got an example to just illustrate this fairly. So we'll start with the Monty Gaussian plot as I'll then give it a call. I'll then sort of translate this to a sort of a more real astronomy use case at the end. But we're basically going to extend another one of our Monty Gaussian plots as examples um, in a way that allows us to look at a hierarchical model. Uh, and so what we're going to do is again we've got these noisy data sets, uh, but the key difference now is our pulses are not all centered at pixel 50, our pulses are not all centered at the same center. Rather, the centers of the pulses have been drawn from some parent Gaussian distribution which has a mean, mu, and a sigma, uh, and a scatter sigma. And so, you know, if we saw 100 of these Gaussians, we would probably start to get a sense that the the mu here, the sense from which they're drawn, we probably start to be visually get a sense of what that number is. Because we can see that a load of Gaussians to the left of some bound, and a load of Gaussians to the right. And obviously, the, 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 the amount they go left and right is the scatter in this. So the key point when we do these paragraphical models is again, we don't really care about the individual parameters of the Gaussians. We're not trying to infer what the center of this Gaussian is anymore. We have to in order to do the analysis. But this isn't the Sort of the scientific information we're trying to extract. The thing we're interested in is understanding what the parent Gaussian distribution, um, the parameters of this are, from which these data sets are drawn. Because this is what actually contains all of the information about uh, the model and looking, you know, the theorem from that. So, um, so, again, just contrasting this we'll, in, the, in, the, in the session, we'll do this contrasting where we'll show. Kind of a traditional method where again what one would do is you'd be given a load of Gaussians, uh, you'd fit each data set of Gaussians one by one, um, and then you, you would get like 10 Gaussians, you'd infer 10 senses for those Gaussians, um, they'd have error bars, and then after the fact you would take those 10 centers and you would fit them with a Gaussian distribution, um, including folding in the errors of the individual fits, and you would get some estimate of the sigma of the mean of the Gaussian. So there are ways to basically extract, like to to infer the there are sort of traditional ways to infer the mu and sigma of this sort of um, underlying Gaussian distribution where you would just fit the data set one by one. And what we'll show in the session, if this is accurate, it gives us a, a correct estimate of the input parameters. Um, but the key point we're getting at here is it produces quite large errors, even for something as simple as this, like a very simple model of just three. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to fit a hierarchical model using this kind of graphical modeling framework and show that the errors decrease. Um, um, and the key concept we want to get across here uh, as to you know, why, why, why does why does this do it is this kind of graphical modeling mindset with this framework reduce the errors um, is because the, the thing with the, the concept we're trying to get, the concept that's really important to appreciate here is the way I like to think about it is the data sets are effectively talking to one another. So if I've got 10 Gaussians, First Gaussian, as I'm fitting it in the graphical model, is putting, it's got a center, and measuring a center. And that center, the inference on that center of that Gaussian, is being sort of flowed back up to the parameters of the hierarchical model at the top. 
So because this first data set says I think the sentence is between 20, think of 20 and 60, that is adding a small, tiny bit of information on the mu and sigma of my hierarchical distribution at the top. And that small bit of information on the mu and sigma of the hierarchical of the Gaussian distribution at the top will then flow down to the other nine data sets and add a little bit of constraining information for them. So, you know, if data set zero says, well, I think the sentence is between fixed of 20 and fixed of 60, and they set one which thinks the sense between pixel 10 and pixel 40. Well, together they're probably going to work out that it's less likely to be pixel 10 than it is pixel 40, because they're both moving inside of 40. So the way of the point of these hierarchical models is we basically have this way where all of a sudden the information that you learn from each data set is flowing across the model and being updated and flowing back across all of the other data sets. Which sounds really technical, and it may be I'm not saying GDA yet, it may be a long time to really appreciate the thing my head around, but is once you start to get your hand on it, it's really, really powerful um, in terms of like, extracting information from large number of data sets. So perhaps an astronomy example might help to just kind of get you on the last slide. Um, so the sort of way people are now trying to use hierarchical models in lensing is the following. Um, maybe they've got 100 strong lenses, and they want to infer the cosmological parameters. Now, they can analyze the 100 lenses and they can get inferences on the cosmological parameters. But, you know, maybe they're good, maybe they're not, maybe they're close, maybe they're not. But they can use a hierarchical model to add constraints that they otherwise couldn't and improve their cosmological parameters, uh, their, 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 their shrink their errors on the cosmological parameters. So the sort of thing people will do is the following. They would be like, well, I know that the dark matter halos of galaxies are self similar Something that we we know that that's something that we learned from all of cosmology. You know, that's really a, a, a very basic understanding. It's something that we really appreciate somewhat from astronomy. Therefore, we know that the masses of the dark matter halos of our lens galaxy should have some level of self similarity. There should be assumptions we can make about the hundred dark matter halos of these lenses that are reasonable assumptions that our model can use to extract more information. So, the sort of thing people will do is they will then Compose a hierarchical model where the mu and sigma of that hierarchical model are the mean mass and the scattering the masses of the dark matter halos of their strong gravitational lenses. And what then happens is this means that the mass of the lenses, the, the mass of the dark matter halo of the lenses, which is a parameter you couldn't constrain in individual data sets, but there's not enough information. Because you've sort of framed it as a hierarchical model, you don't care about the individual masses of those halos, you care about how they kind of all come together in conjunction with all the other data sets when the data can talk to one another. By composing a hierarchical model in that way, you can use the global properties of dark matter halos of lenses to produce a much better inference on the overall topological parameters. This means that you're basically extracting each lens tells you a little bit of information about the dark matter halo, and you're sort of in a, in a very robust way extracting the little information each lens has about the dark matter halo in order to make it sort of better influences on something else that you care about than um, the cosmology. As an aside, um, you know, if you didn't care about cosmology, which I'm sure many of you don't, uh, but you wanted to measure the stellar to halo mass relation, which is like this fundamental property relating the stellar masses of galaxies to the dark matter halos of the galaxy, which a lot of people care about, you know, you could apply this hierarchical analysis and you could you would then infer, you would then infer the, the mean value of the stellar to halo mass relation Bulk component and its scattering. So the hierarchical models work well now can be used in two ways. They can be used to kind of extract more information on a sample on like higher level parameters like cosmology, but they may also be the they may also be the thing you're measuring. It may be that the mean and sigma of that hierarchical distribution, stellar to an application or whatever, is the, the thing that your scientific confidence is interested that you want to write a paper about. And so sometimes hierarchical models are used to extract more information and sometimes they are used to kind of get the information that you actually care about in your research. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of that point where, again, this thing that I highlighted earlier is now like on in higher level models now kind of happening on steroids. Because what you're now doing is you're adding these kind of parent distributions that link all of the data sets. The key point is you're kind of intentionally doing it in a way where you're trying to create these regions of parameter space with these large Sort of overlaps that will then in turn 
shrink the errors of all your office references. And I say, this stuff gets kind of like some code like play. The purpose of this talk was to kind of want to see that when you go to session four or five, you kind of know where we're going with this. Um, but again, I'll just like the base, I really, we already have the basis talk on that, but this is the concept that I like to think about. Now, that's the thing that a hierarchical model is doing that isn't true when you do a traditional fit. When you fit a data set one by one, the first data set has no idea what the fit the other hundred data sets are doing and vice versa. That's the really important concept to kind of go into the session with you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start wrapping up. I think these hierarchical models are becoming more and more prevalent in cosmology, uh, less so galaxy formation, but I do like what's an exoplanet. Uh, so I think I, my bold prediction is these are becoming more and more common and therefore great thing to learn at some schools like this. And to wrap up, I just got this slide, just to the end size. Um, these like graphical models, hierarchical models, I didn't, like, all of this stuff that I just talked about, like this is not common for my astronomy research. I have no idea about all of this, but it is there. Um, it's actually, for us, it's been the, the cancer researchers, the biotech company we work with, who have basically told us how to deal with this. And they've taught us how to do the statistics. They do the medical research. And we've got joint built the software and been able to start applying it to the and now start teaching it to people. Uh, so this is the sort of pictorial representation of like how I guess this all comes together, where it's like on the topology side, we have for us gravitational lenses that we build, we build the other models, and then we build these hierarchical models that try to abstract like information on the fabric of the universe, the cosmology of the universe. And at the same time, using the same software, using the same tools, using the same statistics, the cancer researchers are doing the same thing. They've got like these low-level data sets, like genetic sequencing data, and there's like multi-other models that comes up to sort of flow to like populations of humans, where they're ultimately trying to make inferences on like you know, what medical treatments for like a clinical trial have the best outcome. And so the really cool thing I'm trying to get at here is you know, all of the stuff you're learning, you're learning you're doing this in the context of a cosmology and galaxies workshop, the statistical techniques and tools are applicable for way more than just astronomy. They're, you know, they really are the baby building blocks of most scientific analysis. And I think that's really cool and exciting. Great, so uh, yeah, I'll take some questions. So I've got like 10 minutes. I can take some questions. I'll then do a quick run through of how we're hoping we'll set you up in session one and it'll all go fine. Um, but I'll do some questions and then we'll if there's any questions and I'll show you how we're hoping to run the session. If you have any questions, we can get straight to this. Are there any constraints on what kind of data set you can use in the hierarchical models that you use? No, not really. Um, there shouldn't be. I think the, point, the key point is if, if you're able to, if, if given your data set, you're able to define a likelihood function, so you're able to kind of, you know, produce a mapping that given the data fits the models of that data and turns it to the likelihood, which is kind of the basis of everything we do in astronomy. Okay? As long as you can do that, then really all the graphical model is, or all hierarchical model is, is an infrastructure of combining all of those likelihood functions and passing the information around. So if in your astronomy use case you had 10 different types of data, 10 different likelihood functions, you could bring them together as like a graphical model or hierarchical model. So yeah, there shouldn't be constraints. The only example I can think of is like, there can be a lot of like machine learning, convolutional neural network analysis where defining a likelihood function is impractical. So like the medical research we work with, they have like um, deep learning, scanning of tumor images. And it's very hard to go from like a deep learning algorithm being applied to an image of a tumor to like a single likelihood goodness of fit measure. So in that context, it would be harder, not impossible, but harder to kind of flow into this type of this type of thing.
Yeah, yeah, so it was a benefit. Uh, some of the buzzwords is that there's, this is one of these things happen. There's something called simulation based inference. If you, another phrase you may have heard in the literature is called approximate Bayesian computation. Uh, and there's a few other terms that I can't quite remember. The premise here is basically you, you often might have a problem where you want to extract, you know that your data contains a signal that's relevant and interesting to you. You want to extract that signal, but it's really, really, really challenging to do so in the context of model city and like it's not, not necessarily practical, just in the context of writing a like function. As a really good practical example, to go back, is in people who are actually working on this with gravitational lenses. In the gravitational lens, if we live in that CDM, the prediction is there will be like thousands of dark matter halos overlying the planet budget distributed throughout the universe. And each one of these tiny little dark matter halos will be ever so slightly perturbing the source in small amounts. So that we actually expect there's going to be like little ripples or wiggles in the source plate due to lots of dark matter halos in this lens the end perturbing the lens plate. So in the context of model fitting, people want to extract that. We know that actually the wiggles and ripples in this source have a lot of cosmological information about dark matter. The problem is it's basically impossible to fit a model that can extract that. Because we would have to have a model that has like a thousand dark matter halos. That's like 3,000 parameters. It's, it's, this is when people, if people say that a likelihood becomes attractable. It's because although it's feasible to write down a likelihood function that exists for this, the extraction of that information, the fitting of it, just is too complex. The, the model has too many parameters. So it's similar to this inference, or equivalently approximate basic computation. People kind of go, you say, they flip on ahead, they go by the other way. They say basically, um, I can't fit this data and extract this signal on dark matter. But I can, they can, I can simulate millions of realizations of this strong lens. In those millions of realizations, I can include all of the dark matter of CDN, and I can form all of the ripples and wiggles. And it's basically a set of statistical tools that give you a large library of simulations that maybe some have more dark matter in there, that have lots of wiggles, and some have less dark matter, or less wiggles. It's a set of tools to try to say, in this large library of simulations, which one most looks like the data? Which simulation has the whip, wiggles and ripples? Whip, whip, I really regret using both those words now. Which data has the wiggles and ripples that most resemble the data? So as you say, like it's 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 really it's almost in some sense it's almost the opposite of what we're going to be doing in these sessions because it's like basically everything we're doing here is if I can write a likelihood function, how do I use statistical techniques to extract the most information possible from lots of likelihood functions? Simulation based inference is the opposite, where the starting point is, oh, I can't even write a likelihood function, where do I go? But nevertheless, just to sort of round this up, there is actually quite a, there is literature on the combination of these types of graphical models and hierarchical models with simulation based inference. So they are kind of com coming together, but that really seems to be at like the cutting edge of where a lot of this like Bayesian methods but yeah, I mean, people are thinking about it, but, um, but not something we'll be thinking about in this. <laughs> okay, I will now, so the way we're moving, okay, what's the, is there a coffee break or anything? Yes, so, uh, in eight minutes. Okay. <laughs> Seven minutes. Okay, what I'd like, okay, what? <laughs> Uh, when in those eight minutes, I can, I'm not, I'm just going to be basically right here. So what we want to do is we want to go to this Git. So basically, all of the materials are on this Git link, and there are two ways to try and do the sessions in the process. So it's all written in Jupyter notebooks. Right, so let's just copy one of these. Um, just see if this, but this. <laughs> so basically, the notebooks. The way we the way I approach this is. Sorry, uh, don't worry. This won't this won't this won't happen when you're doing your laptop. So uh, FLS two one. Okay. Um, so like basically, they cover all the things I described, and oh my god, that's, that's gonna take a lot. And then the the Python code you need is already there. So like, 
it really is. You can, you, you, from the start, you can click go on the notebook and it'll run end to end and it'll do all the things I described. Um, so the idea is go through the notebook, take in the concepts. You've got the Python code examples for it to start. Um, but then it's encouraged that you know, if, if, if you finish session one, I'm expecting that you'll probably get it done quicker than I could do. No, if, you, like, you know, if you've got spare time, the key point you're always thinking about after you've done session one, you can think about how do these concepts apply to my research, my science problem. Maybe you have a quick, you've got some data on your life, have a quick go at writing a model that's representative of what you work on. Or at least, you know, get things about it. Always be thinking about how these sessions apply to, to what you do. Don't, don't get lost in this world of one big noisy Gaussians and never actually break out of that to your own research field. In terms of how all of these relations stuff works, um, so there's this great website called Finder, which hopefully doesn't give you epilepsy. Um, so the idea behind Finder is there's a web link at the bottom of this GitHub where you can just click this web link and everything should then just work. So things, it's basically doing all the installation and stuff for you now. The one catch here is myself and Rich are not sure if Finder has like a limit on the number of people using the server. So what I would say is, if we can if, if we can use Binder as like a backup, if you have installation issues, but the first thing we should try is basically just following the installation instructions here, which basically involve making a Python virtual environment. Um, you don't have to do this, but I recommend you do this. Um, you know, setting up the environment, it installs a couple of things that are needed to run the notebooks, um, so like, the probabilistic programming language I mentioned, uh, things like Jupyter, Map, all that stuff right there. Hopefully the requirements just work. And then kind of running notes locally like you would, I assume you run notebooks, maybe you run notebooks on your laptop. Um, but yeah, as a backup, going to find a, um, it's fine, and we'll just see if we get to that button or not. Uh, it takes a couple minutes to load it, it's probably going to be, yeah. But, so first try the installation program. I'm aware, you know, is there anyone here who doesn't code in Python? I just suddenly realized that that's a possible reality. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, well, that's good. I mean, even if you do code in Python, you can go to the network and get all the good concepts anyway, but like, in terms of space, that's not good. Yeah, so I guess it would just be, yeah, go to the general thing, hopefully the instructions work, let us know when everything doesn't work, and we'll crash it and crash it too. And you find it, I guess, you find it as like a Last resort for backup. Don't spend you know, don't spend too long trying to install things that doesn't work, and we'll see if Bindo hits a, a brick wall or a limit at the end. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you, Dave. So this session.